In the last two lectures, we've surveyed the long 3,000-year history of ancient Egyptian civilization. Now we're going to take a wider look at the other end of the Eastern Mediterranean world and look at a civilization which traded regularly with Middle and New Kingdom Egypt, the civilization of the Minoans of Crete. First, I want to describe the beginnings of maritime and village farming in the Aegean Ocean area and the first agricultural settlements at a place called Knossos on Crete. Then I'm going to explore the palace of Minos at Knossos, Minos being the legendary king of the Minoan civilization, and trace the development of this society. I'm going to describe the far-flung international trade which was the lifeblood of Minoan society. And then we'll analyze the distinctive Minoan religious beliefs which were very different from those, say, of Egypt or Mesopotamia. And finally, we'll describe one of the great natural disasters of ancient times, the Santorini explosion of the 17th century BC which blew an entire island into space. And we'll look at the end of the Minoan civilization two centuries later as Crete became part of the Greek world. When Ramesses II ruled Egypt in the 13th century BC, he presided over one of the great imperial powers of the Eastern Mediterranean world. As we said before, it was a world built on trade by land and sea, whose tentacles extended from Mesopotamia to the Eastern Mediterranean coast, the Levant, into Turkey and to the Nile Valley, and as far west as Greece and the Aegean Sea, and ultimately even further to Italy, North Africa, and beyond. The roots of this trade go back far into ancient times. We know that seafaring vessels plied the waters of the Aegean Sea as early as 4000 BC. There were long-distance trade networks which linked the islands and the Greek mainland. These expanded rapidly to even more distant lands. This was a world where most communication had to be from the ocean, where small vessels powered with oars and sails coasted from bay to bay and from village and town to village and town, from island to mainland and further afield. This was a hazardous pastime. Most ships carried many stone anchors and regularly were wrecked to the advantage of the archaeologist who learns a great deal from the contents of the shipwreck's cargoes. After 2500 BC, Many villages and small towns were founded on the Cyclades islands of the Aegean, also throughout the large island of Crete, and on the Ionian islands of western Greece. These islands were ideal for farming two important crops, olives and vines, to say nothing of cereal crops. Olive oil in particular and wine developed rapidly as a trade commodities, and a trade in olive oil and wine soon connected the islands with a much wider world. How do we know about this trade? By tracing the distributions of the distinctively painted pots in which the wine and oil traveled. At the same time, the Aegean also became an important center of metalworking. Much of the ore coming from some distance away, from copper rich Cyprus, from Anatolia, modern day Turkey, where also tin deposits were to be found. This trade centered on small towns on the islands, and the foundings of these small towns fostered considerable cultural diversity throughout the Aegean. A diversity that was fostered by constant trading activity. And inevitably, over the centuries and generations, there was a trend to much greater political 
and social complexity, and the trend towards, towards increasing interaction and interdependency between widely separated communities. Why? Because many of these islands lacked critical commodities and they depended on others for regular supplies of them. Aegean society fostered remarkable art traditions and skilled metal workers, but it achieved its greatest complexity on Crete, while mainland Greek society lagged behind for many centuries with only sporadic connections offshore. And Crete became the focus of the earliest Greek civilization of the communities of the Aegean. And this focus was based on trade. The Minoan civilization was first described by archaeologist John Evans, an Englishman, just over a hundred years ago, in the year 1900. Evans was a man gifted with near sight, and he used his minute eyesight to study teeny seals which he found in antique stores in the flea market in Athens. And when he asked where they came from, the merchants told him they came from Crete. And in the years before the turn of the century, he visited Crete again and again, looking for the site of the fabled Minoan civilization. He found it on a pottery-strewn hillside at Knossos, near the modern-day city of Heraklion. When he started digging there in 1900, almost immediately, he found an elaborate network of rooms and storehouses and passages, in short, a complex temple and palace all in one. He named the civilization after the legendary King Minos of Crete because he recalled the ancient Greek legend of Theseus and the Minotaur. King Minos was said to keep the Minotaur, half human, half beast, in a maze under his palace. And surrounding cities sent girls and boys as sacrifices to the Minotaur. When it was Athens' turn, young Theseus, the son of the king of Athens, was sent. He made his way, with Minos's daughter's help, Ariadne, into the maze, using a thread to find his way out, and killed the Minotaur. Now, Evans was struck immediately by the maze-like quality of Knossos, and he believed that Minos, his existence, had at least some basis in historical truth. So he named this remarkable Cretan civilization the Minoan Civilization, a very apt name. Evans excavated at Knossos for over 30 years. He and later researchers have established that Knossos was first established by village farmers as a small farming community in about 6100 BC, just about at the same time as the large village of Satelhuyuk described in Lecture 15, was occupied in Turkey. This was a simple community. The Knossos farmers lived in rectangular, sun-dried brick houses in a settlement that soon covered a considerable area. Clearly their farming expanded, and so did the settlement. By 3730 BC, the people were trading. There were signs of long-distance trade in the deposits of the settlement in the form of such exotic imports as stone bowls. And then, in 2100 BC, the first palace appeared at Knossos. And this is one of the distinctive features of Minoan civilization. It was centered not on large cities, but on palaces. Palaces where the elite lived, which also served a shrine-like purpose. 
The first palace at Knossos was a large structure with many rooms grouped around a rectangular courtyard. This design of rooms around a courtyard also occurs at other Cretan settlements at the same time. Because there was no one great population center in Crete, the geography did not permit it, but there were lots of relatively small palace-based settlements from one end of the island to another. Each was probably the administrative center of a small part of the island, a set, presumably, of competing small kingdoms. But Knossos soon became the major center of emerging Minoan civilization. The palace itself was an increasingly impressive structure, covering several acres, with the old central court becoming the focus, the center of the expanding complex. Soon, a second court lay to the west, the entire design being a one radiating from the central court. The palace itself was built of rubble, faced with ashlar and reinforced with timber, tie rods, as it were, to reinforce it against the frequent earthquakes in the island area. And despite these precautions, unfortunately, the first palace was destroyed by a large earthquake in about 1700 BC. As so often happens, the later palace was elaborated. It was a much more complex structure, of much the same basic construction, but this time the builders added an upper story, and they plastered the walls and painted them with lively scenes of ceremonies, of gods, of animals, and bulls. There were human figures too, and they're mainly religious and ceremonial, including people bringing gifts to a goddess, and a famous scene of dancers leaping over a prancing bull. If you're interested in Minoan civilization, there is a book which, alas, is long out of print, but I'm going to mention it anyhow because you can sometimes find it in libraries and second-hand bookstores. A magnificent novel by an author named Mary Renault called The King Must Die. It is a reconstruction of the legend of Theseus and of bull dancing set in the context of a vibrant Minoan civilization. It is a wonderful read and a wonderful story and gives you an unparalleled sense of what perhaps Minoan civilization might have been like. And it's definitely background for understanding this picture of the dancers and the prancing bull as if there was some ritual that was practiced that involved dancing or performing with a bull. Bulls are everywhere, is what Evans wrote in his diary about Minos. He found heads of them, depictions of them, paintings of them, models of them. And then one day in 1925, he was reading in bed, and suddenly there was a dull roar, and the ground began to shake. And he realized that what he was hearing was the primordial bull roaring under the floor of the palace. And perhaps this was the basis for all the bulls and the legend of the Minotaur who shook the earth. We do not know, but it's a nice story. Now, the palace at Knossos was much more than just a palace and a residence. Many of the ground floor rooms were storage compartments for such commodities as grain, beans, and olive oil. The palace was not only an important storage area, but a major distribution center for the trade and tribute upon which Minoan civilization depended. At the west end of the court was a series of religious chambers, among them a throne room complete with a gypsum throne, with the residential quarters on the other side of the building. As far as we can tell, Knossos was the principal palace among a network of palaces that controlled autonomous areas of the island. It was surrounded by a crowded town that covered some 185 acres. Crete 
was heavily populated during the height of the Minoan civilization. There were numerous towns and villages throughout the island, many of them with two-story buildings. Thanks to a natural catastrophe, the village of Akrotiri on the island of Santorini, 77 miles north of Crete, has survived under many feet of volcanic ash. You can wander along the alleyways of a compact settlement of two-story houses on the walls of which you can still see brightly painted friezes. What was the underpinning of Minoan civilization? Two words, international trade. The Minoans were expert sailors who kept in close contact with surrounding lands, the Aegean Islands, the Turkish mainland, Cyprus, the eastern Mediterranean shore, and Egypt. Minoan skippers plied the seaways of the eastern Mediterranean, coasting from port to port in heavily laden sailing vessels. Minoan commerce depended on basic commodities, olive oil, timber, and wine, exchanged for metal ores from Cyprus, mainland Greece, Turkey, and elsewhere, for ivory and other exotic materials from the eastern Mediterranean lands. The pharaohs were important customers for timber. Cretan visitors appear in Egyptian wall paintings, while the palace at Avaris in the Delta bears Cretan murals, obviously painted by a Minoan artist. The Minoans worked the entire Aegean, but to what extent Crete controlled the islands politically is a matter for debate. There was certainly strong Minoan influence on the closest islands, such as Santorini, but probably it never ruled over many of its neighbors. Minoan civilization reached its height between 1700 and 1450 BC, at a time when Crete was self-supporting in food and basic raw materials. That's an important point, because it gave them a stability and independence which was rare in the ancient world. By this time, Minoan ships carried commodities from all over the eastern Mediterranean, from as far away as Central Europe and North Africa, to different parts of this world. Now, such a high volume of trade mandated some form of record-keeping system. The Minoans used no less than three scripts inscribed on clay tablets. The earliest one came into use around 2000 BC and has been described as hieroglyphic. It is still undeciphered, as its successor, called Linear A, which appears to comprise lists of commodities, offerings to the gods, and perhaps taxes that were paid. A third script, Linear B, has been partially deciphered and was written in an early form of Greek used by the Mycenaean civilization, which we describe in the next lecture. Minoan religious practices differed sharply from those of the Egyptians, the Sumerians, and other contemporary civilizations. Minoan beliefs were centered on caves and palaces, where people offered sacrifices to individuals who metamorphosed themselves into deities. There were no supreme Minoan rulers or divine kings in the sense of an Egyptian pharaoh or an Assyrian despot or conquering in war. The palaces served as the backbone of religious life. One theory has it that the Cretan nobility had a vested interest in portraying themselves in divine forms to the point that the imagery of gods and rulers fused into one. If this interpretation is correct, then the so-called throne room at Knossos was a chamber where a ruler accepted offerings in his or her role as a deity. It's worth noting 
that some Minoan gods and goddesses appear on the palace's walls. The Minoans also worshipped on hilltops or in caves, where shrines were visited at certain times of the year or times of need. There is also evidence from Knossos, among other places, that their religious beliefs may have included the occasional human sacrifice, something that may have been connected with the fertility of the soil and rainfall. So what are we to make of this civilization? It's very different from that of Egypt or Mesopotamia. It's not a civilization of city-states, nor is it a highly unified kingdom under a supreme divine monarch, nor is it an empire. It appears to really, in a way, be a sort of commercial network. You have Knossos, the biggest palace in northern Crete. You then have a series of smaller centers, like the small town of Gornia, dug by the first woman archaeologist to dig in Crete, Harriet Howes. Probably ruled by an independent ruler who maybe paid tribute to Knossos, and there was a constant interaction and interconnectedness between these different small kingdoms, and together they constituted a civilization with record keeping and a very complex, I suppose you would call it commercial operation, that kept track of transactions, kept track of ships' cargoes and so on, kept track of tribute, because one thing is certain, Minoan ships and sailors and traders were respected over a wide area of the Mediterranean world at the time. And in Egyptian records, there were tales of a distant island far on the horizon called Keftiu. And Keftiu was Crete. And then suddenly, Keftiu vanishes from Egyptian records. Why, we don't know. But there is one possible hint, although a very vague one. In about 1628 BC, and the date of this event is much debated by the experts, a huge volcanic eruption on the island of Santorini, north of Crete, blew the center of this island into space. And I mean blew it into space. If you go to Santa Rita today, there is this huge crater with a volcanic cone in the middle which represents the chasm left by this enormous violent explosion. A huge cloud of volcanic ash fell on central and eastern Crete. High tidal waves must have lashed its northern shores. The prevailing northwest winds carried the ash far over the eastern Mediterranean. How do we know that? From deep sea cores, where the ash forms a very distinctive level. Make no mistake, by any standards, this was a huge cataclysm, to the point where some people have speculated, albeit rather boldly, that this explosion, in fact, represents the legendary death of the lost continent of Atlantis, which sank below the waves. Although it must be confessed that this theory really has no grounding in fact whatsoever. The disaster which rivaled and probably exceeded the great volcanic eruption of the island of Krakatoa in Southeast Asia in 1883 must have caused damage to Minoan civilization, which lay so nearby. In fact, the community on Santorini, Akvatiri, the village we've already mentioned, was buried under many feet of fine volcanic dust, to the great delectation of archaeologists who can see a Minoan village, a remote one, abandoned while it was still being used, with even the pots and domestic artifacts and beds still remaining in the houses. Ash must have blanketed many fields on Crete, but it does not seem to have destroyed civilization itself. 
How do we know this? Because the palaces continued to thrive until about 1450 BC, when the second Knossos palace was destroyed by fire. And then subsequently, a new administration using Greek-based Linear B script appears at Knossos. And this was the language spoken and used by the Minoan, Mycenaeans from the mainland. And it seems that at about this time, the Mycenaeans either conquered or took control of Crete and overthrew the rulers of Minoan civilization. From this time on, Greek Crete became part of the wider Greek world, and its great civilization vanished into obscurity. The only memories of it were in Homer's epics, which speak of King Minos of Crete and the land of Minos, and there's one famous passage which describes Cretan dancing as a wonderful jigsaw of boys and girls on a circular dancing floor, and they've actually found such dancing floors in Minoan sites. Minoan civilization arose from a long tradition of maritime trading activity and village farming in the Aegean area. If there is one theme for it, it is interconnectedness. It is a civilization which adjusted and developed out of the realities of a world where everybody lived on rugged land masses, many of them of very small size, with maybe one or two communities, often with the community itself in the middle of the island and a port on the coast, where much of the year the sea was unnavigable because of strong winter winds or the Meltemi northwesters of the summer, where seafaring was all important, and where the unique ecology of the islands in Crete allowed people to grow vines and olives, and these commodities were highly prized over wide areas. These were the lubricants of a trade, of a civilization that depended on its ability to trade, to handle commodities, and really was an entrepreneur in the very complex and increasingly more complex Eastern Mediterranean world of the second millennium BC. But it was a volatile world, and this volatility was reflected in the vulnerability of the Minoans to outsiders, in the vulnerability it had to earthquakes, to great natural disasters. That it survived so long is a testimony to the economic power of the trade carried in Minoan ships. And make no mistake, this trade was difficult. It was a long-distance trade in olive oil, timber, wine, basic commodities. But it was a trade carried out in clumsy ships, powered only by downwind sails and oars, in seas which are extremely hazardous, a rough sea in the Aegean has to be seen to be believed because literally the waves come at you at different directions. The skippers had to be consummate experts at judging weather, at when to take shelter, what to do when they were caught out, and the casualties in terms of shipwrecks must have been enormous. But all the same, the Minoans clearly, to judge from Egyptian records, were respected for their acumen as traders, as exporters and importers. They obviously paid the right tribute to the pharaohs. There were inscriptions of this. But these countries became more and more interdependent. And at the palace of Avaris on the Delta, we see Minoan paintings which look very like those at Knossos. Now, this distinctive civilization had quite different religious beliefs from those of the Egyptians and other early civilizations, but they were so respected, the Minoans, by the Cretans, by the pharaohs, that the pharaohs tolerated the painting of their art in their palaces. To what extent the Santorini cataclysm destroyed this civilization and weakened it, we do not know. But two centuries later, the gravity of Cretan civilization passed and shifted to the mainland, to that of the Mycenaeans, whom we describe in the next lecture.